Okay, so I do want to um, let people know. So this, so this Be Live platform um, allows people to comment uh, and ask questions on the live video, um, but they would have to uh, be direct on Kayla Zagrosi's Facebook page and the original live video to do that. So if people do submit comments um or questions and we happen not to bring them up in this live feed it's because i'm not seeing them i'll so, watch i'll watch the ism page <laughs> okay I want to, uh, tag yeah. into the Illinois museum lockport page i'm sharing it there now and i apologize and, to anybody if they are already watching because i talk a lot and so i may miss you and forget to um, forget to cover it you know no, no. so welcome yeah. Welcome, welcome. Kayla, Thank you very welcome. much. John okay. and Kayla. <laughs> yeah, so we have um so Mark Staff Brandel. Am I saying that right? Yep. Yeah. In English, that's how I say it, yeah. Okay. Um, and we are uh talking about over drinks and um gonna get to know Mark and hit Dr. Greatart and um Dr. Greatart since you've been Dr. Greatart since when? 2016, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're gonna have to tell us all about that. But okay. um, first, I wanted to um, ask you. That's the wrong document. Let me pull up the right one. There we go. Um, I wanted to ask you first if you could give us an introduction of of yourself and tell us about your background and give us all the details. Okay, I got sort of stock things I always say. So I got some notes in case we look up because <laughs> I tend to repeat. And I'm trying to see if I don't repeat it. But I'm an artist and art historian, and I consider both. I used to be a critic, I haven't done a long time doing more history and theory. I'm mostly known for what's right now, at least for the last 10 years or so, for what's called mongrel art, which are hybrids of installation, sequential paintings and drawings, in other words, comics, and uh, incorporate also now lectures as performances. I, I now have this project where I've called Dr. Great Art, which is kind of like Dr. Who, I'll explain it, not that I'm so great as I show great art. Um, where I do public uh, performance lectures concerning art history. Um, I was born in 1955, so I always like to do it like an art historian. I say I'm an artist of the Venticento, and I was born mid-Novecento in 1955 in Peoria, Illinois, which no Europeans watching this will know where it is, but it's a medium-sized town south of Chicago. I grew up uh, mostly in Pekin, an even smaller place nearby. I lived for many years in Chicago, which is where I lived the most anywhere until I moved to Europe. I've lived primarily in Switzerland since 1988, where I became a citizen in 1995. I am both American and Swiss, and like them both. Um, with actually a German heritage, but that's only other thing. Um, what else? Oh, I studied art, a lot of stuff. I studied almost too much. I studied art, art history, uh, aesthetics, literary theory at the University of Illinois, Illinois State University, Columbia Pacific University, and I got my PhD in art history, magna cum laude, from the University of Zurich uh, in art history and metaphor theory based on uh, brain science. Oh, what did I do? I'm, well, I am up until for like for a few days more as uh, an associate professor of art history at the Kunstschule in Liechtenstein and the Schule für Gestaltung in St. Gallen, Switzerland. So I will, in about a week, I will be emeritus docent. So uh, emeritus, uh, and I'm happy about that. Bravo. Uh, <laughs> made it through. Bravo. I'm active internationally as an artist since 1980, which began in Chicago, in Illinois. Uh, I've won uh, all this business, like awards, publications, and all this stuff. Whereas some of the places I've shown is US, Switzerland, Germany, Italy, Egypt, the Caribbean, um, specific cities. Um, what can I see? What's happened recently? Paris, Moscow, Chicago, Istanbul, Los Angeles, Prague. I just did New York. I just did. Uh, as a critic, I used to write a whole lot. It's been a while when I was a writer for London's The Art Book. Um, did Shark Forum online with Wesley Kimmer a long time. Podcaster for Bad at Sports. 
I now have my own podcast, so I've been working more on that. I was theory editor for Chicago's Proximity Magazine and contributing editor of New York's Art in America. And I uh, sometimes curate, but I'm a pretty shitty curator. Um, <laughs> mostly just help people get shows. I have. Um, uh, Why is that? Why is that? Um, I have not, not um, practically organized. I can keep like 60,000 years of art history in my head, but I can't remember what i had for lunch and so i'm really terrible at uh i'm not organized enough to really be doing actual like say museum directing which is okay everybody has to face what they are i know i'm a really great teacher but i would make they ask me like would you like to be the the director I'm like, no you don't want me you want my wife but <laughs> um forget it um but i have to i did to i curate the kunstbrill in zurich and the collapse Scholarly, a little thing that I want to talk to you about for your museum. I'll talk to you about it another time. It's a small little, literally a collapsible Kunsthalle that I dragged around with some famous artists and friends of mine in it. Where I have worked in, this is the part artists always do that nobody else interests in the Museum of Modern Art in New York, Victoria and Albert in London, Whitney, Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, Sound Gallery Art Museum, Tour Garden Museum of Fine Art. I'm in love with the Tour Garden one because they have 27 works, most of the rest have like two. The ETH Graphic Collections, Zurich Museum of Contemporary Art, Los Angeles International Museum of Cartoon Art, Art Museum Olden, I can't remember anything. Mm -hmm. And my big thing right now is I'm currently writing a philosophy book for Bloomsbury Press, uh, a series called Aesthetics and Contemporary Art with uh, David Carey and Tiziana Andina as editor. The book is tentatively titled Visual Metaphor in Contemporary Art and Analytic Philosophy. Um, I'm both um, schmeichled, so uh, flattered by it, and also scared shitless. I said yes to do it out of pure vanity. I'm the only artist and art historian involved, the rest are professional philosophers. And so of course I said yes, and then came home and looked in the mirror and said, what a jerk you are, because <laughs> uh, now I'm scared. You take a, uh, you take a, um, a union approach or a, no. a con Kantian no. approach or a no. Aldorno? Contemporary. So I'm primarily based in George Lockup in cognitive um, metaphor theory based on okay. Uh, okay. Uh, brain science research. And so I'm extremely contemporary. Um, some little bits of, of post-modernist stuff, not much. Um, politically very much influenced by Dr. Cornell West sure. um, in the political philosophy. But primarily George Lockoff and Mark Johnson, and so uh, so-called cognitive metaphor theory. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, there's all this stuff I love. Goodman. Um, I'm just reading right now Noel Carroll because he did the first of it. Nobody's written about visual metaphor, uh, and I'm a, I want to apply it to art. That's a big deal of mine is to show that it's that uh, using the body is thinking. So dancers are thinking, artists are thinking. This is a thought process. Uh, it sounds to all us artists, it sounds reasonable, but most people don't believe that. <laughs> There's also a kind of cool thing happening. A guy who collaborates with me a whole lot, a novelist and media theorist named Daniel F. Aman, is putting out a book in a month or so in Magoria Press, which is 22 years of his essays about my art. So I'm always straddling this line between these, these two, uh, whether I'm an and I. It used to bug me, and I think then people say, oh, you can't do this. Come on, everything I do is more or less art. It's not like I do nuclear physics on the side, although I have been collaborating with some stuff with uh, Chris Fuchs, who's a one of the most important quantum physicists, where, but I'm doing more like illustrations. For me, so. Um, yeah. yeah, so that's kind of my whole background from there, you know. Um, so co a, cogn a, cognitive, a cognitive metaphor, uh, I'm just going to follow that up with um, yep. how far does it how far do you take it before it transfers into an allegory, let's say? Well, you know, there's a, a cognitive metaphor theory, I mean, is Lakoff's thing, which is based on MRIs and so on. It take a long to explain, but it's basically, they think that, uh, and I believe, I agree, and they have pretty serious scientific proof that you think based on bodily experience. So they've refurbished the idea of mind, that it's the brain in the, body in the world and so and then abstractions come from that so for instance his favorite al um, 
uh, illustration is he says, we think up is more. We're always saying like prices went up. They didn't go up. You know, they, 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 they're they more. Uh, but when we pour water into a cup, it goes up. And so we base a bodily experience. And then like all metaphor, and that's what I do show that there's a visual equivalence. There are about, well, I, actually there's like 15 basic metaphors. Uh, but there's about eight important ones. And allegory is one of them. That's where you bring a bunch together. There's metonymy, litotis, um, which you use negative, um, hyperbole. There's all these different ones. And I believe they apply to visual art, but I would say we actually get to use them even more creatively. And that's one of my contentions. Um, some people think that we don't at all. Um, I think actually visual art can use it even more more creative. It's quite an interesting thing. So um, allegory is just one of those. I use the word, by the way, trope. Now trope is kind of misused in the art world. They use it to mean cliche. But trope is actually the old word. It's from Greek, from turning, uh, because actually metaphor is one type of metaphor. It's a bad word. It means where you say something's like something else without the word like. So the famous one is Achilles is a lion. But it also is the word for all of them. And the old word was trope. So I use trope for, because the other word for all of them is figurative language. You can't say that about pictures. So so I say trope. So if you hear me using that stupid trope word, it's because I had to dig around for another one and I could only find that Greek one. Buzzer, we can hit the buzzer on trope if you want. We can. Yeah. <laughs> well, Kandinsky, right? This is Kandinsky, uh, uh, the elevated triangle. I mean, there's all, there's there's always that illusion, and I just. Well, he's dealing mostly in symbolism, which I don't do much, but because um, I think it's actually concretized. But uh, yeah, yeah, there, there, it's definitely a continuation from them. I could tell you, but primarily, I have one particular theory. Um, uh, well, let's see if I can find my little thing because I have a short description and I don't want to get too far. But I called no, metaform. I don't need uh, either. It's it's mimetics in my mind is what I'm is what I'm hearing. Am I wrong or uh... no? Mimetics is one thing imitates another thing, um, mm -hmm. but that could be part of it. Uh, this is that you use these things and we use them. Let me explain what my PhD is based on, and then what I will do applied to this. Is what I call metaform. It's a it's a neologism, a, a word play. Take the word metaphor and add M to the end. So it's okay. like metaformal, but actually metaphor. Mm. And it's that I say that the formal, technical, and stylistic aspects of a creator's approach concretely manifest content in culturally and historically antithetical ways through a trope. So creators are creating tropes, they're creating metaphors. So this is, we seek to discover and often in a kind of battle and discussion and so on with things we love, other artists and so on, but also the process. So I'm emphasizing just the process of painting, process of doing things, we discovered the tropes. And so in a lot of ways, I'm saying the metaphors are in the, um, in the form, but it turns formalism on its head because they wanted it to be just form. I'm saying it's important because it has metaphoric content and then content has form. So I'm turning everything upside down. I, it's kind of idiosyncratic. Jim Elkins, do you know him? The great yeah, art historian, a friend of mine, he was teasing me once about that. He said, I'm so idiosyncratic that I'm lucky that I already had all my jobs or nobody would hire me. But uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I just followed my ideas. I think care. it's because I'm, a, I'm a practitioner, and so we think more about the actual objects. Probably you two both. You're both curators, right? And and so, so I mean, you de live with objects, so it's a different world than people who are only with ideas. You know. I think I think I think um, for me in in my role, uh, the idea comes first, and I'm trying to match the content up with the idea. Ah. Uh, and, and the, the content, I mean, I, I have I have several math equations that I that I roll out it was some algebraic equations. Uh, I'll, I'll email them to you, see if you can figure uh, That's uh, nice. That would be, let's see. So if you're using it, algebra, that's what, because then that's an analogy. But then which which actual metaphor would that be that's in the same context of idea? I have to think about this. I think that might be a metalepsis. And it, there's like a name for all those kind of things. And that's your model in your model. 
<laughs> but that so that's where my thing comes in and so it's just this practice and and, and what do we do and that it think that it comes through struggle that we struggle with our materials and so and so it's not something you can sit down to me and think of you actually discover it and usually you think about it after i always tell my students think between objects not before you do it then you look at it and discover what you discover. then you go to the next one and so you always think and keep working so it's probably a version of the old throw the spaghetti up against the wall and see if it sticks uh, and uh, but wait, if it actually feeds it actually feeds into the notion of sweet sequence sequencing and narrative yeah. and i mean i'm 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 digesting what you're saying in terms of your cognitive approach yeah and uh, um no it, it it does it does connect it does connect up but elkins did okay for himself so oh yeah yeah and we have non-stop connections and he came here and we talked about stuff and uh, uh yeah we go back and forth even when we disagree i love him i mean we have all sorts of uh, but i mean he he signed one of my books uh one of the, his books that he gave me he said to another inveterate in um um how did he phrase that um diagrammer because we both draw diagrams all the time to explain which is another thing that's kind of a picture and kind of an idea and kind of a comic <laughs> so it's like you know mixing them up so yeah that, that's my metaphor thing we went pretty far into uh into that but that's what i'm thinking a lot about and i will be back on that as soon as i wrap up some of the stuff i'm doing now um, the last several of my podcasts which i'd like to get people to go listen to dr Gradar, um have been i'm going to do the chapters as as podcasts it's it's the second chapter about what is visual metaphor in three parts so sometimes I, it's chunky but i mix it up with other stuff like the first one is one of the best ones it's uh, about how it was illegal to teach women art you know, until... I, was actually, I was actually just gonna say i would highly recommend that everyone does go and, and look at um and listen to dr great art podcast because i went and that was the first one i listened to was how it was illegal to teach women art um I that disgusting why, yeah why art history is important and then about how artists create metaphors so all of those are oh, in there. you picked yeah, three so of the best ones <laughs> I, I think i did and then um maybe about what makes a piece of art remarkable but yeah that first one of of how it was illegal to teach women art i honestly i didn't know that and yeah. uh it was very it was very interesting and insightful to listen to yeah i was just thinking because i my class is very often now a lot well they were now because there were a lot of women and what's i got to say it's something i repeat but i really want to say because i teach in a thing called the Höhe fachschule it's a it's a hochschule so it's an art academy but it's a kind of a, a second wave because it's hard much university here is damn near free but much harder to get into uh, than in american ones uh, so there's this other way and they have to pay partially and so on but anyway so there's a lot of people that go um uh, what do you call it? we call them Quereinsteiger, the people who like did another profession and come back so largely women and a lot of whom who started uh art and then stopped for different reasons the family so i've felt a lot of this stuff about women because i have to tell you it's really wonderful i was teaching them in the university at the same time it's changed now, but about 10 years ago, most of the university was in art, or the, not university, it was art academy, they're divided here, were young men. And one of their major questions was always like, something along the lines of, what do I do to get famous? Because we're in the American Idol, Deutschland sucht the superstar world, you know, post. And I was like, actually, if you want that, go into music and leave us the fuck alone, okay? And so, <laughs> and then these women, I'd get them, and some are even like 40, mostly they're like 25, but they'd be up to like 40, 50, because they're, and they always want to talk about like why and what's it mean, because they had lives and they're bringing their lives and they had kids, they have stuff. Um, I was just very thrilling. I, I think women could change the art world, could be the best new thing to change the, what I consider mannerist, academicist art world. Which is another theory I have that some people disagree with and get angry with me about that postmodernism as a form of mannerism. But I think the women could revitalize that because every return away from a mannerism is always a return to lived experience. Mm -hmm. And so when I hear things like Abramovich saying women mothers can't be artists, pisses the shit out of me. Because, why? Be because they'd like bring knowledge of life 
You know, that's what we need in art. We need less art about art, and more art about life. Well, and, and, and this is this is changing. I mean, the, the, and and that and that comes out of minimalism and conceptualism, of course, mm -hmm. and, and 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 Joseph Boys in so many ways. And, and um, uh, I I always think there's a marriage between the idea and the object. And, yeah. and in the museum profession, yeah, our 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 methodology is to protect the object ultimately yeah uh, which i still that, love i love museums i have to say i've never been against a museum um i get some questions about kunst Halle and so like that now and so sure. what there was one you asked me one question you sent me some ideas and one was what was that about what makes art great or something yeah what um what uh what makes a piece of artwork really great or remarkable yeah, that was a good question. I had to really think about that. I got to see. I had to write about oh. because it brings up what John just said. Because I was thinking as about the definition of art and stuff, which I resist. But you sort of have to think about it anyway. But it keeps changing. Um, I said that works of art are great for many reasons, mostly if they are strongly personal, yet rooted in the culture of the time of the artist. And by that, I mean both exemplary and critical. They can, so I hate that the post structuralists always think it's just a sickness. Oh, they just represent the problems. They also sometimes represent the attacks. Um, I believe art is, needs to be visually, technically well done, but not necessarily traditionally, but anyway, in some way surprising and yet innovative. And here comes what ties into what you guys are just saying that I think artworks are truly best when they encourage multiple interpretations. So they're done on purpose to be interpreted a bunch of different ways, not just one. One can be powerful and strong, but that's design. And in, in fine art, it's where the form and the content are inextricably interwoven. Essentially, one mirrors the other. They go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And, and that's what gets you. It's like, mm -hmm. wow, that's the perfect way to say or to sing that or the paint that it gives plus also that paint so it goes back and forth so it's just interwoven i think and through that it hits your eye your heart and your mind so the, I, the, I, the contradiction of that is for the artist is um uh you have to get pegged into a certain lane right yeah. otherwise you start moving outside of your lane oh. and, and there's and there, there are a handful of artists who've been able to do that, and and I'm I'm not going to embarrass them. I mean, we could name drop all day. Yeah, but there's um, only like four or five where it's been allowed by the art world, like Art right, right. Rand, and and uh, 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 yeah, there's yeah, you're right. It's a big. Thing. I did that when I began as a late conceptual artist, and then when I saw it was turning into neo conceptualism and academicist, I still love conceptual. I start to repaint again and so on. Because I, and I realized then I didn't, but later I realized what I was doing was looking for this mongrel idea to be sort of post postmodern. And man, yeah, Jesus, it's like being a reggae musician who suddenly does, uh, you know, like a, a heavy metal symphony or something. Man, they beat the shit out of me. It was like, yeah, you can really, you don't change in public because people want to put you in a category and of course they do it even stronger to women because you're already in the category of woman which is you know so um yeah or black people you know well you're like black people. yeah everybody's something mm -hmm. you know but uh, you're not you're always more and less than that but yeah yeah oh good there's about four or five but really a Gerhard Richter although now he's been the same for ages but for first his earlier work was great because it was so mixed up um who's a few of the other ones uh the few who have done like two, three styles, but usually you got to hide it, you know. It's, I showed you earlier my whole life. Usually I only show curators and stuff the part they want to know about. So I act as if there's a logical progression, but um, there's not. And it jumps all over, except I have to say as a beginning to become old man. When I look back now, I realize I only got like three ideas. I was thought, man, no, I'm a real Leonardo. I got all this stuff. Now I realize I got like three ideas. I've been beaten to death from different directions. <laughs> You know, <laughs> and well, no, Rick, Rick's a great example. Richter's a great example of of a, of a of an artist who was able to morph successfully, yeah, and now that successfully, um, um, again, the, yeah, the American names. There, it's a short list. Yeah, it, it 
really a short list. And and I don't Lucas know. Lucas Samaras. There's a great American who did it. Lucas Samaras, the Greek sure, guy. Sure. Yeah. Definitely. Those Polaroids that he started working yeah. on late videos. And the um, objects. And he was also one of the first happening. And he did probably the first installation ever in his mirror room. He could jump around. Yeah. But uh, actually, he suffered for it for years, too. You know, and, and, Why, and, what are you then, doing now, Luca? Stop that. You know. <laughs> yeah, there, and there you go. And so and then it's equating that. So so the pursuit is valid. Right. And, 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 and I think we all do in our everyone in their studios tries to tries to reinvent. But um, uh, uh, I don't know if it's the ego or the market or the identity that gets in the way or the perception. And, and you do have to concentrate. I realize you get a couple ideas and you got to beat them so you see what gets out of them. But yeah, we do change. And it gets back to this thing where I said, well, some people have told me, said like, oh, um, Mark, you, you know, or, or they say in German, man kann nicht, one cannot be Leonardo. And I usually, because I do so many things, and I say, Man feel like nicht of a mark do so maybe one cannot be but mark can and so it's like uh, and actually i'm not and when you think about it in a certain way everybody is because you're a husband and a father and right, start to count up your things in life you know and and you already got like six paths everybody and so it's actually sort of silly to limit people that's not human you know, you're good. And I, I'm yeah, I'm doing this. I'm writing this book. And then I got to go out. My wife has a giant permaculture garden. And then I go out and I'm her assistant, like digging up holes or whatever. You know, so like these are different things. And um, everybody does that, especially if you, I don't have any kids. But I see that with people who have kids. The only kids I have are my saved animals. So I always got like five fluffy kids. <laughs> Your fur baby? You like to call yeah. them fur babies? And ours yeah, are all, my wife saves animals, so ours are all risk things. Yeah, I, you know, she I, says I, she I, takes street, she takes street animals and brings them in, including me. <laughs> um, I, I, I find being a parent and, and in this, in this field, I, I, I was very resentful before I became a, a parent. Uh, oh, I'm working on an artwork with my child. And I, you know, I would, I would have to suffer through these lectures of, oh, look what <laughs> Look at me with my six-year-old, and I, I, I would literally, I would, I would walk. I, it was, it was just so egotistical to hear this nonsense, and, and so, um, would a, would a brain surgeon bring their child to work? Would a lawyer bring their child? To work? <laughs> um, and, my dad and, but, took me, but he was doing uh, a window display and sign painting. So, sure. Uh, <laughs> sure. but that's different. He didn't cut anybody's head open that I know of. <laughs> If, unless it fell on them, but I do, I do think, I do think that the, the sense of time is really important in all those conversations, and which goes to what I think your equation of what makes a piece of art great. I think it's got to, I think it's got to uh, have some uh, sustainability at, at some level. Yeah, well, that gets to she listened. Uh, uh, Kaya just said she listened to my one about why art history, I guess, or why Dr. Great Art. There's two different ones. Um, I listened to why Dr. Great Art and about the art history. Okay, why, is art why art history? Because that struck me because I, I love history, but I actually, and people would get touchy with me like, oh, history. Well, then you're like inculcating the people with it. And then, but other people would be angry and say, like, well, everything you're doing, you're always criticizing history. Well, yeah, that's the point. It's all just about tools to use now. You know, so you learn history um, so that you can watch everybody repeat it and destroy society again. But but the, <laughs> it's very negative of me, but I'm feeling that right now. But, you know, that, yeah, that I think this and I think parents and so on feel that in a way they have a personal history there that it enlarges them. Um, a lot of people are very, very limited. I noticed my wife runs social systems and so on. I noticed social people have a much broader view. They view like all of humanity as their pe people you know where we tend to be like just or i tend to be mostly artists and, and, and philosophers and so on they're very broad and i was like wow that's great they expand in that way plus with her it's interspecies because she does with animals and so on she works with a really interesting woman sister Teresa, who's a zen buddhist priest and a franciscan nun and she saves animals so so they have this expanded well, we, when you have history, you have, we are expanded in time. I notice that all artists, not just historians, but especially historians, we talk about like Goya, like he's alive because he is. 
And so, you know, we have this expanded sense of people will say to me like, oh, that was a long time ago. And I'll say, oh, that wasn't long ago. That was only like 600 years. And they're like, oh, yeah, wow, we have different views. You know, <laughs> like a long time for me is like a million. I used to show off about that because I would say I do 60,000 years. I do one thing, 60,000 years of art history in an hour and a half. And then I just have a new one where I do six, Dr. Great at 60,000 years. I'm real proud of this one over the time of art history, only women. It took me eight months to research. It was so hard to find. You know, but I would show off about that until once in the audience, you know, I was saying, well, my friend Daniel's always complaining he does literature. And I said, yeah, but come on. You got like a thousand years. Your damn language is only like a thousand years old. I do 60,000 years. And the guy raised his hand and said, I'm a geologist. <laughs> it's like, you win. Wow. <laughs> they got millions, you know, billions, I guess. So, <laughs> but it is important. Yeah, the canon is being restructured as we speak, and and these voices who hadn't been heard from are now being considered. Um, I, I I look at I try to pay attention to it all. It's always curious to me uh, uh, what is fashion, what is yeah. uh, it, what is what is an attempt, you know, to find gold in those hills, and and what will stick to the walls ultimately. Yep. And I think it's important to note to what happened in the past, uh, to see that also, that that's not true, because you'll hear from a lot of curators, when I say that, I mean like international traveling curators, you know, Hans Ulrich Oberst and so on, not ones running museums and so on, because they're more trendy, about how, yeah, well, we know everything, and it's like, no, you never do. You have to think about the time, one example I always use is when Vermeer in the Baroque, he was almost unknown because he had to work really hard. He had lots of other jobs and different stuff because in those days you had a lot of kids and they all died. Remember, it's all his kids died before him, both his wives. Uh, it's terrible, but it happened. And they would sort of plan for it. You'd have like 12 kids hoping you'd end up with two. Vermeer had, um, oh God, what do you have now? 13 kids and one wife and only one kid died. No, that's wonderful. But it meant he had 12 to feed where he thought he was going to end up with two. So he did, he was not as well known. He painted his things, he did his best. We look at him now though, and we think, wow, amazing. At his time, Carlo Maratta was like big, huge. And I looked up Carlo Maratta, he's boring as shit. And he was like the Jeff Koons of his time. And now we don't have their politics, we have our politics. We look back and we say, oh, Maratta, God is that God awful boy. Look at this Vermeer, look at that girl with the golden earring, look at that. We don't know shit about him maybe, but man, those paintings are bitching. And so I think that helps to have this perspective you get from history that things are not the way they say it is. The future will look at it differently. They will have their own political problems, but they won't have ours. And so my main illustrations is Jeff Koons will not disappear, but he'll probably be in the basement with Bougarou and not actually as much. There'll probably be one up on top or so, like Bougarou, who painted really well, but it's it's it's, academicist so you know things will change and and some woman or something around the corner who i'm ignoring because i'm too snooty or something it's going to be like they're going to look and go look at these fabulous paintings and i'll be oh man i live near her and i didn't notice you know so you can be blind in your own time if you don't know history you know? I, I always quote jose ortega gossip he did a, a great thing and I can't find exact phrase anymore but he said that history is like a technique of friendship and conversation with the dead and so I look at his friendship and conversation with the dead and the living and it puts you in your own place also with yourself you get to have a little more perspective on yourself like uh, I remember when I started my comic mixtures and I did the first one where I painted a giant comic on the wall what I call panels installations and I thought man, I'm a genius. Nobody's done anything like this. This is like a giant comic thing. Have this sequentiality. I would write about, well, probably like three or four days where I thought I was a genius. Well, you know where I live, right? So what happened to me? I went down to Italy and I went to the Sistine Chapel and it was the same thing. <laughs> you know, and I was like, oh shit, how did I forget Michelangelo? You know, it's like, but I had there about a week right now. <laughs> so well, it helps you put yourself. Yeah, all of those cats. Uh, um, uh, yeah, that's a lot. The, um, ask a question, Kayla, because I because I'll I'll go yeah, down. We're dominating. This is typical. Thought, no, 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 no. I'll, put, I'll go down. Well, Dom, Domier did okay editorially, mm -hmm. right? We, 
he he he, he landed okay, and and uh, and Jeff uh, Jeff will be fine because he's gonna yeah. buy up. He's gonna buy up his real estate and create a a temple to himself, and and um, and he's got some really important works. That rabbit is probably the best postmodern work. I'm not gonna run him down. I can also tell you a couple, well, only like two, but something Bugarus. But uh, yeah, so there's no reason to run. But it's not at the level, you know, because that's politicking, you know, and things come. And they also sure. go and come back. Right now, Yosef Boys is is unjustly uh, ignored and criticized because he was too. Uh, honored before he will balance out in between that happened to Andy Warhol in my lifetime too yep. uh, who's of course incredibly important but yep. was thought to be here and then they pushed him to here and actually he belongs about here you know so it's no no well his death I mean that, that was a market I mean he again um, uh, no boys is boys is close to me i think about his his teachings a lot and and how he yeah. stressed the how he's i haven't thought idea. about him in ages which was funny until i had to look at some of your things i built an installation for him <laughs> but i don't say much about it because when i did it he wasn't all that well known and uh now it would sound like i'm trying to cash in or something well now i could probably uh -huh. do it again because people are ignoring it more but there for a while when he was the superstar but and then I realized, well, this teaching thing, I'm doing a kind of an American comic-y form. His is very German. It's all about, you know, he, he was exciting as hell, but he would talk for hours with sentences in which, like, the verbs are all at the end of the week. You know, it's a typical German. And uh, and, and and I'm doing this more entertaining. But it has a lot to do with him. You don't, you don't have a, you don't have a, you don't produce a, a level of students that he produced. Uh, I do, generally. but I don't re produce ones that are similar to me yeah he had yeah. a tent well, although i was boys, one of his boys didn't i, I was one of his so so maybe oh, is that right yeah so uh there's a connection there but yeah he had a tendency to i don't think it was so much on purpose but he, he, he john baldessari was even worse he tended to reproduce himself endlessly uh it's always been a big deal for me to not reproduce myself to try and get people to or a con you know a con the, they're, I mean, you, you're right. We, they get tra they get trapped in the rabbit hole. And uh, um, uh, hey, so Mark, I I'm going to ask one more question because you pulled up that mug. Um, and then we'll let Kayla talk a little. And I'm gonna, <laughs> so I really, no. I really think I, I really think that uh, the best drawing um, the last sixty years has been in comics. I really do. Yeah. I think the best drawing that's been done. I, a friend of mine who's an abstract painter said all the figurative artists went to comics. And I don't think and, all did, but yeah, a lot. Yeah. Oh, no, no, not, not even, not even, that's a, that, but I, I, I'm talking about drawing as, as an Yeah, artist. that's what he meant, though. The ones who wanted to draw the figure sort of gave up on fine art. It was just a witticism, but there's a certain truth to it, yeah. Yeah, it just, and, and which, uh, which I know, I obviously you know it's close to you, it's close to me, but how it feeds into the sequen sequencing and how it feeds into the narrative and how and how we in the West are actually wired into read in, into reading. Yeah. Well, the so, thing, the, one, one thing that's interests me a lot because of my mongrel thing, which is essentially, actually, if you know ar archaeology, the word would be Creole. Uh, that's what they use in archaeology to mean a mix of cultures. And I, my wife and I lived in the Caribbean for a year. And so I know the wonders of Creole food and so on, you know, music, this mix. Um, but I went for mongrel because uh, I kind of like the insulting aspect of it too, and uh, um, and my animals are always mongrel. But uh, is that um, well? I'm launching off here. I'm sorry, but but I wanted to get to this with comics. Is this mix? I think, yeah. and, and I realize the things that interested me, like comics. I from Chicago, the blues is like, you know, everything has something to do with the blues, and then you got gospel and jazz, blues, and all. Everything American is either half black, half African of any importance, or a lot of Jewishness in there too. A lot of Jews were doing the comics and so on and so too. So the the so-called minorities or whatever you want to call them. Um, that's why I also have hope for what's gonna happen when women now take over a lot of stuff. Because these mixes are always healthier, just like a, a mongrel dog is all, lives like four or five years longer than a purebred. I am genetically a purebred. I'm ninety percent German. What's up? I'm um, not very proud of that, but at least my culture is American, so it's all mixed up. Um, so, yeah, they, they interest me a lot with that. 
even even though the English language, which I like, but English language is actually, uh, if you look at it linguistically, it's a Creole because um, it's actually a dialect of German that never had anything to do with High German, sounded like Swiss German origin, mixed then with Old French and then Latin, and so it's it's a bastard, it's a it's a mongrel. And so uh, that inter and that has to do with the comics too, which interested me. I don't want to slum like Liechtenstein, although I like his art. Um, I wanted this mix, and they don't appreciate each other. Is the big problem I've seen is that comic artists think, or comic fans think, fine artists are just like publicity ploys or whatever. Fine artists think comics are just like naive or something. It's not true, and and there's the crossover interests me mix between high and low because you're talking about rock and roll and hip-hop and all the things that um i love actually. yeah tom, tom bard knows tom bard knows high low show um at the met uh that still sticks with me as a young kid my first trip to new york wow was, what a thing to see for your first yeah and then and then walking walking into a gallery and and uh seeing a fish tank with three floating basketballs you know, yeah. and you 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 come into this, and your head your head is charged, and it, and and it's exploding with this notion of art is with everything, is within everything, and um and, no, and, and so th one thing for comics that I always concerning I've been very involved with I make up a lot of words right so you gotta watch neologisms but I made up one a really ugly one but it applies called econo sequential. Um, and that's what I've been working on, um, where it's a mix of iconic, something iconic with something sequential. Do you know Frank King's Sunday comics no, from the 40s? He did no. a wonderful thing. You should look up Frank King, those famous Sunday comics uh, of, of um, Skeezitz and Walton Skeezitz. That's um, Gasoline Alley. He did, they were huge at those uh, Sundays, the whole page. And it was one image of a house. But it's not a house. First, it was a field. The next week, it was a field with a hole. The next week, it was a field with a hole in some structure. Da 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 da, -da till it's a house. And then it was each of those though was one image, but divided into panels. And the two, so uh, Skeezitz and his girlfriend, they're young kids in the strip. They grow up and get married, but here they're young kids. They change in every panel, so the background stays. So it's sequential, but also. Um, Iconic because it's one image. So not the old ones like where Jesus does a bunch of stuff in a painting because that's kind of a mix mishmash and it's actually more of a mythology analogy. Um, allegory. The uh, um, but these things and things like that affected me, and I'm trying to work with that. Where the thing is all at once, the strength of like a painter and installation, but also has a the sequential part. Not always narrative, but somehow sequential. And so that's my newest thing I'm still finishing up, which I'll send you a copy then is um, I'm doing a new, you know, you have to do like documentation every so often for, as an artist. And it's always so boring. You know, it's like your resume. Now I'm old, you know, mine's like 10 pages long now and stuff. And nobody reads that except another artist. And we're only reading it to like criticize each other. And, and then this stuff. So I did it in comic form. It's me having a little adventure with my wife and the dogs, and we go walking, da, 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 da. you know, right. so I'm trying to mix all these things. And in the PhD, every chapter ended with a one-page comic and began with a painting by me. I'm going to see if I talk the, the other one into it here now. I'm not sure because the press is the most important philosophy press on earth, and they're probably going to resist that because... They'll say like, oh, those are comics. It's not serious. I'm going to have to fight that probably. But I'm hoping I can do. And if they won't do that, then I'm going to say, okay, but then I got to have one chapter that's all comics. So I'm bringing those things together. And that essentially, that's it. The sequentiality and the creativity of somebody like Steranko, Frank King, uh, especially Will Eisner that I can't get over since I discovered the spirit when I was like 10. Um, the, these, these insane mixes yeah. you know uh, and, and it, yeah you're right about and, and these wonderful young young kids for me um, like an old man yeah. but like uh um persepolis you know that marianne satrapi and so on her adventures from iran and so, um oh god you know so there there's amazing inventiveness 
that to some extent we're missing out on in fine art because we don't look back and forth and we need to look back and forth. I think a lot about in that sense, like James Brown, who inherited the blues, but turned it into complicated, you know, polyrhythms and so on, which, or Duke Ellington, um, who intrigues me more than Beethoven, but you know, this, this sort of mishmash. And so that's where I'm with comics, but I, I was awesome to do like superheroes and stuff, but I just can't bring myself to do it. So. Have you seen uh, Scott McCloud's uh, book, Understanding Comics? I, I got it in like English that. and German, and yeah. Yeah, I mean, he he basically took two D design it's theory beautiful. and ran, and he and he and he did a great job, and and uh, uh, he's had a lot of mileage off of that, and I I recommend that to anyone who's out there paying attention. Um, Me too. If, I don't agree with his definition, but um... oh no, no, but but he 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 meshes he meshes two D design theory into uh, in, into the comic book structure, and it just it it sings, it, it really sings. It's an easy digestible. Do you know? Uh, speaking of that uh, kind of stuff, moment. do you know? Do you know Larry Gonick, the cartoon history of the universe? I yeah. love those. That's one I would take to show young kids when they'll tell me like I don't like history. And then I show them the cartoon, which is, you know, telephone books, three of them. And uh, from the big, big bang till now. And I show them that and they're like, what? and they start reading and then they, they like can't stop. Say, no, 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 no. You don't like history. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're losing book. That tactile act. We're losing that tactile act of drawing because it's all being done on the iPad. We're losing that tactile. Um, and we've been, I, we've been talking about this for years, you know, the cognitive approach to, to physical art making is, is uh, that skill level. Um, I do like most comic artists when I, when I do even the comics, I go back and forth. I was advised by several professionals. I've still have a lot of contact with professionals doing mainstream comics and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, John Jennings is a great one um, from Illinois. Now he's in California and he was on the East Coast. Um, African American who does all sorts of that wonderful um, uh, on getting offhand, but it, it, one of the best ones just it won the uh, it was the um, New York Times bestseller and so on. Uh, and Damien Duffy has collaborated. Um, yeah, we've I've spoken I, I've been emailing and intersecting with him. He's in St. Louis. Ah, Duffy's well, in St. Louis. Yeah. Hey, Kate, let's uh, let's bring this back. Yep. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say, <laughs> no. Okay, I, let's go to Kayla, and then I'll stop talking a little bit. You can ask me some stuff. Uh, that, it, it's, a, it's a tough conversation to follow up. Um, I was actually just going to say, let's talk about, um, let's let's start talking about the overdrinks. Oh, yeah, please. Yeah. Let's, get in, <laughs> let's get into the overdrinks. Get concrete, yeah. You have the, you have the, the napkin pulled up that um, I think everyone is able to see. So um, talk to us a little bit about your 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 work in, in over drinks so how many napkins you did i think you have well john's got the details i believe yeah let's let's I've define been... let's define i'm going to define the project so, yeah please do because that was really exciting um so this was a follow-up uh two years ago uh i was i was feeling a little uh i was feeling a little ranker as i always do and uh i had the last fax machine on the planet it felt like and i just said hey Let's, uh, anyone can fax me some artwork and, and, um, we received faxes from all over the country and it was a really great exhibit. We called it just the facts. And, um, it was, yeah, I sent you with my, my illustrated art history for that. Yeah. Yes, you did. And, and it, to me, it was about the moment. It was about technology. It was about identifying, uh, the self and, um, and our site, even though we're even though we're in the suburbs of Chicago, it, it sometimes feels like they we're a little bit off that grid, off of those. So I was an attempt to connect things up, and so the Over Drinks project was just a natural uh, because I'm we're tied into this historic district, and, and uh, it's an entertainment district, and people people want to experience us, experience. Uh, uh, the canal and experience our site and they want to go out and wine and dine and those are where my best ideas come just sitting sketching at one of our establishments and i said well, this is we need to uh, we need to democratize this a little more and, and and see what happens so we put a call out 
and you were kind enough to send us some. You were kind enough to send us some of your uh, your students' work. Yeah, they and, thought it was exciting, so I thought I'd let them try. Yeah, and and uh, you know, it, it's it's easy it's easy to do an exquisite corpse show to call yeah. thirty artists. It's easy to do a a napkin call thirty artists, you know. But I, I'm I'm more interested in seeing what's out there on the pulse and out there and how people can respond. With us being closed, and now we're in this, we're in our phasing, and we're we're going to be tying back into the other economic issues. Um, I think a, a project like this resonates even more, and so we're going to continue on with it. The exhibit's going to have its full viewing, but um, your response. Yeah, I just put up a picture of a corner that you guys posted, and so <laughs> your 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 response to the your response to the problem, or to the challenge was um only dr great art could do this right <laughs> i mean you you came you came in with uh what 16 17 uh drawings where you actually talked about the history of napkins let me see 17 the, 18 uh, plus the 18 yeah. yeah yeah do we have number one kayla do we have ancient greeks do we have that on the queue. Um, I think he was going to. I think Mark was going to. I've got it. I put this up. I can get rid of that. Let me see. Hey, Kayla, what do you do, by the way? You're the curator or what of, um, I haven't heard any. <laughs> I don't know what you guys do. Oh, no. <laughs> Kayla's, a Kayla's a volunteer and she has assisted with our current exhibit, uh, Surplus Scrap, which is art that's been generated out of the Joliet prison, oh. which was abandoned, uh, uh, in 2000, when they when the, the old Blues Brothers prison, ah uh, um, yeah yeah yeah, oh god I remember the fire. There was a fire there uh, three years ago, and Kayla, along with a couple of artists, have got access into the prison and uh, have built a pretty amazing show out of the remains and the remnants. And so. Uh, um, uh, that's that's running concurrently with the over with the. Oh, over so Kayla, there. you're an artist then. I I'm not. I actually do more of the administration work and more of uh, all the keeping the artists together. So there's 23 artists, so it's a pretty large group, <sighs> and it was two years of work, and it, it was a lot a yeah. lot of hard work went into it. What it, did you study? Or are you still studying, or what did you do art history, or what did you what do you do? Or I actually haven't really dabbled in art. <laughs> much or the art world for the last until the last two years oh kayla, cool. is, kayla is perfect mark pa kayla is the new <laughs> breed because she does she's coming in with zero baggage she's coming in with zero preconceptions she's coming with an admin background a sales background and ah. and um she is the ideal front of the house if i was if ah. i was larry gagosian i'd hire her in a second <laughs> and pay her good <laughs> i would and, and so she's been cutting her teeth with us and and, and um yeah you should it, say that that because we need that kind of stuff you know we need, need that bridge yeah yeah you need that bridge between the idea and 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 the consumer and i say consumer meaning the the audience and and Kayla brings a very much on the ground approach to interpreting art, as well as um, yeah, keeping the cat keeping the cats in a bag. And so, my, speaking of cats, my cat is screaming at my door to my office. Literally. Go ahead, go get him. <laughs> so this is this is Mark's first napkin. So he yeah. he brought in um, he brought in seventeen napkins and. and and it's it's reflective of his approach. Obviously, it's very sarcastic. It's very satirical. But it's the uh, truth. I I just thought well the napkins. I do the napkins, and I did the history of napkins, and I researched it. And that's kind of what Doctor Great Art does. Actually, I think the best part of Doctor Great Art is when people hit me up for stuff. The biggest hit has always been the the sixty thousand years of art history in an hour and a half. And uh, it's actually fully truthfully and all the thing, but of course it becomes funny at the speed and so. You know, what do you want, little girl? She's talking away to me. Come on, get her out. That's why there's no cats. In we, have inter we have an interruption with the. Um... That's why there's no cats in heaven? I saw a cartoon. It's because they can't decide if they want to go through that door or not. The uh, <laughs> she went in, went out. 
So I thought, well, I'll do the whole thing. And I researched it. It was insane. It was new to me. I mean, that's what I love to do the most. Give me one. I did one for social work. They were like, do the history of social work in art. Like, holy shit, social work only exists since 18 something or other from uh, um, yeah. basically uh, the, the, the Christmas Carol and so on Dickens. But then I researched. And this was this, too. It was like, I really did. Greeks, I found out they had it. But it was lumps of dough and pieces of bread. And then they wiped their fingers on them. And then they ate them. I was like, yeah. And so it was like probably multiple people. We wouldn't even be allowed. And so then I worked my way through. I found the political aspects at the end about the Koch brothers and, uh, mm-hmm. you know, et cetera. So I just worked my way through and, and researched and then just sat and drank and, and uh, doodled them. And, you know, and the cool thing with napkins, I used to do that when I used to drink alcohol at the time at Danny's Bar and Max Tavern in Chicago, is it soaks <laughs> in. And gets this weird look, and so you can't really control. So you see everything is kind of messed. Oh, you can see my my um cursor. Yeah, it's Batman. So uh, the, the, uh, yeah, the yeah. the nap the yeah. napkin yeah. itself the napkin itself as a social convention is is uh is an extension of etiquette. Is an is an yeah. extension of of protocol. It's an it's, it's an extension of sanitation. In, yeah. in in some some way and and, uh, and the whole paper thing is funny how it came and went and so on and uh, it, it, was, it was quite interesting i ended and i just let it follow what it was and that's why i ended up with 17 plus an introductory image so 18 was just those were the like 17 different ideas of salviette as we say here or napkins and and so that's yeah and, and so that's a doctor it's a history and then the little on the side there's always or wherever i can there's a little um pattern that's also from the art of that time this is a right. famous greek pattern yeah I try to find in, that word. drop in china i enjoyed china as well okay let's see if we find where was china china you, where oh you, yeah uh, and the, and then one of the cool things I like to do, and that comes from comics and my father, is I fake lettering styles and so on. <laughs> so I would do like fake or, you know, I make words that look like they're on fire and all that stuff. And this is like fake Chinese, you know, this that comic booky thing. And uh, yeah, and there it is. They do these folded ones for the T and uh, your typography, your typography. Yeah, uh, there's a name for that semiotic typography, but it's a terrible name. But I just like to say, uh, um, because sign painters did it in, in comic lettering or something like that. But there, yeah, that was a kind of napkins. They were paper, but they they treated them better than we do. And then this is a Chinese. And then I would research that because the, the, that's the, the research part of me. I like to I like to research. And so then I go and find stuff. And I remember vaguely like, oh, God, there was this Japanese that, you know, did it. And then I go search and. Um, well, you mentioned yeah, you, ref, you referenced temp in the in the in the uh, China napkin, and and uh, the the race is the race is on here in Illinois. I think that's the only thing that's keeping our state afloat right now. Is what? Are the dispensaries? I, I have a, I have oh, a theory. Oh, oh yeah 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 hemp yeah. Used to white because chaos actually that, hemp was so much more important for paper up until Rockefeller destroyed it basically. Right. Make money out of out of wood and. I've got a couple of friends, you know, they're like ex smokers and so on and too, but they're super propagandizing for him because it would actually make, uh, it would be really good for Switzerland because we can't grow cotton or anything, but you can grow humph, it's called here hemp, you can grow that in the mountains and it's, it doesn't require chemicals and you don't need slaves to pick it. And so there's a lot of good stuff to it too. And I've propagated, and then people will say, "Oh, what are you like a you know a kefir? They call here so a, you know it's pot smoke." And they're like, "No, I don't smoke anything. I had asthma as a kid. I hate smoke." What? Oh, this is I. I just think it's a really cool substance, you know. So yeah, and that was paper. Our 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 uh, constitution is written on hemp paper. So that is true. Quite, so I would like research all this stuff. What? Where did I get the the uh, uh, what's a weird one? Oh, uh, this one. Wasn't there one with Enjoy. toilet paper? What? Wasn't there one with toilet paper? Or no? Yeah, there's something. I'm trying to that think was the, Chris. 
Yeah, that would be good for now, right? Everybody. Right. I heard a good joke from an from a, a Albanian friend of mine who immigrated to Canada in the war, lived in Switzerland a little bit as a refugee, and then now he's in Britain. This is anyway. He told me a joke that they tell in in England, by the way, and that is if this lockdown continues, Kleenex is going to be able to buy Microsoft. So. <laughs> You think you think that I I don't know the stock prices are uh, are kind of fickle right now. Yeah, I think everything's going to crash, but I don't give a shit. The um, <laughs> where is the? I don't know where that is. Let's just pick the fifty. It was the percent. Or... <coughs> right here. Which one? Number sixteen. Yeah, uh, I have the uh, I have the object. Okay. The object. Oh, you yeah. got it. okay. Then I can share it. Yeah, 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 I'm not sure if it's uh, re if it's reading. I'm in my I'm in my uh, I'm in my office downstairs. So, um, oh yeah, both you guys at home, I guess probably. Are you still in lockdown or not? We are. So we're 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 phasing back, and, or we and um, you know we're in conversations with the state, with the government, with museums, and uh, we want obviously we want to be open, but uh, we want to be safe and and. Uh, Same here, many, and I, I can't go anywhere because of being a, too, my too wife, though, I think it, it, if we don't open up soon, I think my wife is going to kill me. We're like, you know, we're not, we're like all together all the time. She was working at home on home office and I had to do, it's like, we're just here all the time. You know, it's like, my God, it's, it's a good so what is this non pa oh, paper towels, there not toilet go. paper, paper towels. Oh, yeah. People began to use paper towels as as um napkins and so on so it, it's a question about what you could do because i didn't realize that napkins are un, not recyclable because they're so low on the recent they've already been recycled two three times you can't break the fibers anymore mm -hmm. and so you got to throw them away they don't do anything uh, which is a sort of a shame because at least you know, so um the other would be to use uh, cloth ones and wash them which would go back to the old style you want to be green i'm not as green as I should be, but I'm getting there. The greens are usually uh, involved with us. SP, I'm in the SP here. I'm a New Dealer Democrat in America, and I'm a Social Democrat in Switzerland. The greens are more consistent with my wife's pretty green. Um, so I'm trying to get more green. I tend to be more interested in social things. Like when we go shopping, I always laugh because it's like you buy coffee. I'm like killing my, everybody's out buying toilet paper. I'm looking for fair trade coffee because my right. lefty shit comes. And she's like, yeah, yeah, but it has to be bio, uh, organic. <laughs> like we're looking for organic free <laughs> trade stuff to get the green and the socialist. Okay, so. <laughs> Switzerland, Switzerland's ahead of the curve on, on uh, environmental concerns. Pretty good. It was one of the problems with the EU because um, if we joined the EU, we'd actually have to, all other countries would have to raise their standards. We'd have to lower ours. Yeah. So it was part of the battle is that the left was against the EU because of the green stuff and the right was against it because they're just against foreigners. So um, it's good to be at the head of the curve. Yeah, it, it, we got a lot still to right. do, but the, we, we, we got some stuff. We just won the thing. Most cows have horns. We've got a few things that are still coming, but we still got a lot of, yeah. Everybody has, you know, industrial animal killing and stuff that you have to look at. But, yeah, so here, yeah, that was paper towels. And then I was looking at what else could you do? Because looking at myself, I didn't realize half this stuff. And it's like, yeah, I'm buying, I'm buying napkins. And of course, I'm supporting, uh, where is that? I'm supporting uh, the Koch brothers how much, or whatever. How much, you know? how much has changed since up in Sinclair, Mark? Yeah. Matter of fact, I think we went backwards partially. Well, one would, yeah, one, one would, uh, one would presume that, especially with how, where these, uh, where this virus seems to be finding its way. Into, now this uh, is weird. Yeah, so we're we're just loosening up now. I just went shopping the first couple times. Uh, we have no mask uh, requirement. We have distancing mm -hmm. requirement. But mm -hmm. I live in the countryside, right? In a in a traditional house in a meadow mm -hmm. next to the forest so actually i can walk and do everything and not see anybody if i don't want to so it's actually easy for me to not have trouble with that 
where I have a good friend who's a curator from Alexandria, Egypt, and she's a single mother, and she's in Toronto. And she's like, what do you do? And she has a small kid. She's like, what do you do? You go, can't go outside with the kid. You can't. If I was in Chicago, I'd probably be killing myself if you can't go to the parks or something. And we're here. I can just go outside. And, you know, we're going to go. find her. Well, and there's there's this, um, I think there's this social issue as well. Uh, uh, if, if you're, if you're a, a person of color wearing a mask, oh, yeah. uh, you're, you're, you're branded. And, and and so now we're being told to wear these masks, and and so there there are these contra there's this contradictory perception that that's always continuing to go on, and society thanks Kayla seems to be working. Society still seems to be working for for all. It needs to be working more for all of us, and and, um, and so yeah. with this, I think people did pretty good. I'm this pretty is happy with. But there always this, well, somebody wrote in Facebook when person cited somebody else. And I thought I thought I said that um, crises don't change people, but it brings out who they are. And uh, so I noticed that's true. Yeah. So racism gets intense, all sorts of stuff, you know. And, and one guy made a funny comment that I thought was hilarious. He said, um, he said, it's the truth, but I got to say this. I went to the bank and I wanted to go in the bank, but they wouldn't let me in until I put a mask on. So times right. have changed. <laughs> like, right. Right. And before I, I, they would have immediately arrested me. Now I have to. And we have no masks. That doesn't thrill me, but I mean, and I could wear a mask, but that doesn't do anything if nobody else does. So I do wear a mask, and, and so does the physiotherapist when I go to her. Um, I have a little thing with my shoulder, old people crap. But the, uh, um, the rest, not so. Gonna, yeah, let's see be, how we get out of this. I hope so. Yeah, I hope the art masks, world learns something too, because we learned some stuff about that. Some of the things we thought were important aren't all that important. It's like uh, people are going, "Wow, the Basel Art Fair is not going to happen." And pretty much gave a collective yawn. People are like, oh, yeah. yeah," because I mean, the gallerists even it's like they just get milked by that damn thing. You know, it's like you know. The, the, Art fair makes money no matter what, but the galleries have to pay a fortune. And so it's like, who cares? You know, we got bigger concerns about whether an art fair happens, you know. So I, I hope maybe that gets, but like Cornell West said, I am an addict of hope, but not an optimist. So <laughs> I always have this hope. Well, you, I, you, have, you have to be optimistic as long as you're above ground. Um, that's usually been my my way around this and uh um but i do i do think that what's happening right now and i'm and i'm trying to pay attention to it and and i and i equate this to 9 11 mark because there's not much art that was generated post 9 11 that really resonates only only to say um outside of the experience of 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 people putting flyers up and that collective grief that happened. Um, and I was having a conversation. The only thing that sticks in my mind were Eric Fischel's uh, free falling bronzes uh, that he, that he made. And, and now of course we're looking at, at art that was created during the plague and during the 12th or 13th century. But I'm really curious as, and, and I'm, I'm paying attention as to what's going on. You're seeing some interesting things, with graffiti, you're seeing some interesting things in the streets. No. Um, I'm, I'm, I, I try to pay attention to what's going on in the studios, um, but, but there's a, there's a self, there's a selflessness that's happening, um, and this self isolation, which I'm waiting to see what happens in, in the end product or in the end object, and um, it's happening as we speak, which is actually kind of fascinating. Yeah, to me. I'm hoping we learn stuff, but I I, I can't be optimistic. I, I'm too, like Mark Twain, he said, you're, you you have to be optimistic up until the age of 30, and you have to be pessimistic afterwards. But he was always left. I will stay left, and I will stay hopeful, addicted to hope, as Cornel West says. Um, I always quote the Bible, uh, Hebrews, hope against all hope. But uh, but. I don't really have optimism, so I don't usually 
say that to the young students and stuff because they should have optimism. They're beginning. I think I think a civil I think a civil society, and I think I think the answers are right in front of us. In so Actually, many ways. yeah, that's what part of the depressing thing is that it doesn't take a genius to figure out half the stuff. You know, it's like if we, right. as my cousin who is watching us here, Michael Brandel. Hi, Michael. I just see his thing. Is a uh, renowned economic professor. I always say the other Dr. Brandel. Um, and he uh, he said it just shows some things that like that I don't know what it's called in English the citizens we almost got it citizens income universal citizens income it's translated from German in my head it's this idea that everybody would get a living amount of money like welfare it was actually a concern and he said how much this shows this could this would have taken the whole edge off this problem if we had this it was a conservative man a, a conservative um thinker from germany who proposed this you would eliminate all these uh, social programs and all those tons of stuff in there, but everybody would get a living wage just barely enough to get through mm-hmm. and then whatever else you do on top is your problem you know and, and yeah, well, of course it would work Krug, krugman krugman just recently is starting to articulate a counter argument to that based on where we are right now yeah uh, at that time that that the the um Oops. investment investment really needs to to go into that health care into that prepare yeah well that's first in america because that's but he this guy is german so of course they already have that he's talking beyond sure. that you would have health because we have health care and education really high in this area here high and free the next mm-hmm. thing would be maybe this then you would lose a lot of stuff that would be harder for museums it would be harder to be probably less artist grants and so on you would eliminate a lot of that to pay for it um because then you wouldn't have gold but it just shows that there's probably some things like that that need to be thought about because of the covid that we think wow if they had that then we would not have everybody with the middle kayamu we call them the small and middle businesses would not be having a big problem and so there's a whole lot of stuff that it brings up that I think could be time to think new ideas, but I don't really think they probably are going to. Like, does there really need to be 17,000 airlines? You know, it's like, I mean, I only ever fly like two, you know, Lufthansa and Swiss Air. And so it's like, I don't know, you know, it's a, so they're every country, is, you know, et cetera. So time to be thinking about a few of those things. You should have 17,000 museums, but not... <laughs> airlines Kayla Kayla has her airline favorites I know you use United you said right I am a United Airlines girl I I had a one last couple times I had to fly really fast because my mother died and I went to Alabama where my sister lives in the Gulf Shores and I had to do a United and uh, had a really good experience they saw me as a matter of fact even the guy on the phone who was getting my my tickets and it was like big big deal talking to him and then he tells and I tell him why he's oh I'm sorry and everything so he tells me he's a Hindu and he's going to pray for my mother to Ganesh that was so sweet I said well thank you because I'd already had some Muslims tell me and Christians so that was a real nice mix so I was like oh that's a nice group of people <laughs> so Ganesh, so, uh, Ganesh, is, Ganesh is the elephant is yeah the elephant. The coolest god on earth an for elephant the, for the, headed you're not paying attention is the elephant god so you got that going for you, yeah. And he looks cool, Mark. Mark, I was hoping I was I was reaching out for for you to have some optimism for some hope, and you're coming I have back hope, at me. But not optimism. You're coming back at me with skepticism. Yeah, that, uh-huh. I, that 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 I divide that I got from Cornell West, along with my definition of what I am, which is a uh, um, adapted from his, which is a, um, a jazz man of the intellect. A blues man of the soul. I forget exactly how he said it, but I say I'm a, a jazz man of the intellect and a, a rock and roller of the soul. And so uh, he is my one of my major influences, which caused me some trouble because he criticized Obama so much. <laughs> but I think he's a genius. He's even on my wall here. I have a picture of him. Oh, I've met him. You know, did we're, a portrait we're, of him. We we still we still live in a great place where you can um, you can speak your mind and express yourself and. Uh, it might not be the most popular thing, and we might be in a an era an era of tribalism, yeah, and uh, xenophobia. But I do think um, we're we're all in this together. 
one way or another. You're just going to have to do something about Murdoch. I mean, well, encouraging know, hate speech and, and incitement to violence should, is actually, I could, if, if he would broadcast here, I could get him arrested. I, 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 I think it's important to bear witness to all points of view. I don't, right because I don't think hate speech is the same. For instance, you can't do it to people. Uh, there are laws about libel and slander. But somehow America doesn't apply that, as we say in German, they're blind in the right eye. They never apply that to the right wing and they never apply it to rich people. They only apply it to individuals. Like if I say you are a jerk, you can sue me. But if I say it on like television, then I can get away. So I think you have to also be held responsible. Uh, yeah, you can say anything, but you have to be held responsible. And if it incites violence, I mean, can you imagine if the, the stuff they say on Fox, black people said that stuff, man, they'd be in jail or shot. Or, or when in the lefties in the 60s said similar thing. See, you're being edited, Mark. You're being edited. <laughs> you're being censored in real time, Mark. That look at that. Mark's been Mark's Mark then, goes you know, out you. Or I you know just look at the thing. <laughs> Mark, Mark, Mark. Yeah. The last 30 seconds, the last 30 seconds, uh social media dampened everything you said. <laughs> Probably that's uh, Bill post. Gates and uh, and and, Murdoch and George Soros and whatever. I know. Right, right. Talk. Elvis, you got to get in every conspiracy theory. You got to get Elvis and the Pope in to be really cool. There you though, go. Yeah. In my opinion, otherwise it's not a good conspiracy theory. Jesus, if at all possible. But, yeah. Ask one more, <laughs> Kayla. Oh, oh, well, I think we we honestly covered all the questions that I had, but I would like you to. Um, plug your websites, the podcast oh, again, so people thanks. know where to find you. And I'm going to add it to the post after this video. Thanks. And I wish you'd talk more. I'm sorry. I have a tendency. You know, I learned so much in this hour plus. I mean, I am so grateful that you sat down with us. I love this opportunity and I was so excited to get to talk to you and get to know you. So um, we, we, from what I've seen, there's a lot of positive feedback and I think we may have to do another one of these with you because it's uh, be fun. It was a lot of fun and good because I've had little contact, but I haven't, um, seen you or whatever you know and it's always so nice to see no. mark who were your who were your contemporaries in peoria and when you were making art in peoria or, or coming of age in peoria what were you looking at comics and um my debt my my big vision i've even made fun of that's the uh, the famous well somewhat famous i mean as far as i am of the painting of uh oh, let me see i can probably show that um was not so much fine art, but it's there's been a variety. Oh, you did ask that here, actually. I wrote that up. I sat down and thought about that. Um, good. Uh, you asked some really great. Are these from you, Kayla, or from John, or who are all these questions? They were really uh, good. We worked on them. To, we worked on the questions together. Kayla's yeah. better delivering questions than I am. <laughs> you, you asked me who influences outside of comics. That was a good one. Yeah. yeah. What other and influences outside of comics? Yeah. The wellsprings of inspiration for me when I was about 10, was billboard sign painting and display window decoration, which my mother and father did both. Um, Earl Brandle and Ruth Staff Brandle. The staff is, is her last name. That's why I have two last names. And uh, superhero artists, mostly Gene Colan, who is my personal, I mean, I got to know him. I have art by him, talked to him a lot. Um, he did Daredevil. He created Blade. He created Gardens of the Galaxy. He did Dracula. He was one of the first ones to be really loose. He draws like Tintoretto. Uh, well, he did. He passed away a couple of years ago. Um, That's and a great I, analogy, colon to Tintoretto. Yeah, I, very, very similar. Tintoretto's one. And, and then the fine artists, I, went, I changed, you know, at different times. There was a time when it was Yosef Boys, and primarily it was his belief in art that got me, really. I think all artists love Yosef Boys, but not all curators and so on because they're a little more critical but artists saw in him like oh wow this is somebody who believes in art because it saved his psychology and so on. Uh, there was a time I went through R.B. Katai was a big thing for me I haven't thought about him in years I just thought now and Tintoretto I go every time I go to the Venice uh, Biennale I go uh, when I'm tired of all the contemporary stuff in the Arsenale and so on then I go to San Rocco which is his Sistine Chapel it's a church or a, a salt uh, Ah, mixing up languages. A hall that he painted everything, and that's why I like Tintoretto. Um, yeah, so those those are kind of 
I went through different phases, really, of stuff. Uh, probably Gene was the overriding one. And I even asked him once. I said, you know, you never really taught, but I copied. He laughed and laughed. I showed him I copied, like, every panel of his when I was, like, 11. And oh. so I said, can I claim you're my mentor? Because also it would make people nervous because you're not supposed to say. So in German, I always say he's my hero. And they don't like that word hero. And so oh. they will get nervous when I say he's my hero. And I go, but he is my hero and you're not. <laughs> so I was like, you know, that's Gene Colin is for me. Well, Colin, but, Colin, more, Colin did a lot more mystery comics and yeah. A dark drag stuff. Drag. Yeah. yeah. And most of I love, they re he was the first one they reproduced finally nowadays they're doing it because you can put it in a computer and up the contrast so you don't have to ink him and uh they reproduce directly from his pencils i have two uh, three on my wall that are just amazing one oh, i should show it to you but one is Very huge cool. and it's wonderfully drawn where he drew his hero and one i created in imitation of his style when i was 11 years old called micro his great power was he could shrink so it was stolen from ant-man and the uh he drew it. He thought it was funny. He drew so my, my, my favorite, my favorite uh, um, Chicago artist of all time is Ivan Albright. Oh, he is very good. There's a lot of Chicagoans that I like too. Actually, I mean, you've yeah. got Paschke, um, right. a, a lot of the ones. Just not. I mean, one we never did get to that. Why I left Chicago, so I could answer okay. that. Yeah. I was um, make it real short. Uh, it was about eighty seven or something and i decided it was kind of over for me that's when the sort of kirshner clan we used to call them, took over uh judith rosie kirshner and, and people from the uh school of the art institute started imitating jeff coons and so on and they made it they just wanted to make a big movement i understand but it really stole away a lot um a lot of what i thought was really really good about chicago we had these people like um stuff was happening but it might be because i was part of them like raul deal who's in milwaukee and does okay. uh, social social um practice sort of thing community arts wesley kimler michael paha the installation guy Je uh, tony fitzpatrick who i think is amazing um gary justice jeff hope me so on. and they sort of took over with this fake new york and i realized chicago was chicago is a bad habit in the art world not in not in music and not in literature and not in theater of self-destructing um probably take off uh, you know we lost out to los angeles because they believed in themselves they became the number two where we were the number two then so then i was like well i think i'll take off that's it too i'm a good well, believer the, 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 I, the history of that time the history of that time too and and i was i was uh 20 or my early 20s that and uh Galleries would galleries were jumping to Philly, or they were jumping to Brooklyn, yeah. or yeah, you know. to Brooklyn a lot. And, yeah, and, and were, but it was always a thing of Chicago where you would leave, and and I think it is was, it's, it's it's still in me. I mean, Gabriel Gabriel, the daughter of of Tony Fitzpatrick, who uh, is an Italian expert and so on, was here, and we met in Florence not too long ago, and she laughed and stuff. She said, "I have a Chicago accent still in English, which I didn't notice anymore." It's kind of cleaned up because I have to talk to non-English speakers in English even. We teach in German, but with a bad accent. Well, Fitzpa Fitzpatrick's an interesting story because he had to leave town. Yeah. To and he's back. still, he's, he's more well-respected elsewhere. He, uh, he's, yeah. uh, he, I think he's but, great. But, no, uh, like but I was going to say he was, the, but he's still strong. But anyway, that is, I thought I'd go to New York. Well, then I met my wife by a connection through Max Tavern, which was an artist bar. It's now closed down. It was the time the Artful Dodger and, and so on, a couple. And and uh, met her actually in my kitchen, of all things. She was Swiss. She was coming with a friend to travel America. And then eventually we stayed together and all. And then I was like, I was going to go to New York. And then she liked Chicago so much. She said, let's stay. We stayed for a year there. We lived also a year in the Caribbean, in Tortola, on the British Virgin Islands. And uh, But anyway, at some point then, she was like, well, she's going back because her job works best here. She runs social systems. And since America has none, that would be a complicated affair. So uh, should we like come back? So I thought, well, I'll go along. And I have to say, it was a, a lot of my friends told me like, oh, don't go. You're burning bridges and all this stuff. And it was the, I usually am a stupid idiot. That was one of the few good decisions that I made. I was like, no, I'm going out of love. And if, if it collapses, like most of my affairs ever did, then I'll come back. It's like, you know, 
and I probably lost five or six years of my career, so to speak, lost. Um, no, when, had, when, when, you left, when you yeah. left, it was a, it was an amazing time um, in Chicago because the market was changing. I do think the Neo Geos yeah. were flooding in. Um, the MCA. Well, copious, where we got copious of the Neo Geos. And so that's what bothered me. It's like we were losing this weird, quirky Illinois do your own wacky thing like uh, like the the you know that everybody used to pick on them but they were damn good the um, images and so on. yeah and, and so i left in 80 i landed in switzerland 88 uh but i was legal from 89 on um mm -hmm. so that that was really why why i took off and why i ended and then we moved around here several different places but uh, i've been you have to like register where you live here i ungemeldet and I'm angemeldet in Switzerland, paid taxes and all that stuff since then. And so, which is, thank God it saved my ass because I'm, then I naturalized. And so I have the social system. And so um, I'm living, gonna live pretty damn good actually <laughs> compared for an American artist. How often, how often are you back in the States? Seldom, only when I have shows. Uh, for the last while, it's been every year. For a while, it was every three years. I would only, when I had a show, I had a show, uh, which I couldn't go to because a bunch of stuff happened at, uh, I see she was watching here, Maddie Rosenberg at Central Booking, a wonderful book gallery in New York. Um, mm -hmm. Hi, Maddie. And uh, the, um, uh, but it was like, and I didn't go, but then usually I would go for that and then go to Chicago and then go to wherever else, somewhere else. Last time, the last couple of times was a bit uh, traurig, um, sad because I like, my mother was sick and I thought, we thought she was going, she was 80 something. Whereas my sister should be on here, she would be able to correct me. And uh, um, went back to see her. Then I went to Chicago, then I went to Milwaukee to see Raul, who I hadn't seen since we were in undergrad together. And he does his community arts in Milwaukee with the Latina exes and the um, uh, black kids and so on. And then went to the art farm outside of Milwaukee from down in Jay, there's this wonderful art thing a worm farm institute and so anyway that sort of thing and then i go in and i go to like one other place and then go back but usually new york you get stuck there for a while upstate new york my best friend from pekin is a professor of uh, religious studies and poetry he translates sufis out of arabic and so on thomas emil homeron from pekin and peoria we were born on the same day as a matter of fact i go visit him then I go to Chicago, visit whoever's still there, although most have moved away. And then I go to one other place. And recently that's always been Gulf Shores, Alabama for my sister and my mother. Then my mother died, so I had to go in seconds to there, go with my sister. Um, so I don't know how much it's going to be now, of course. I don't think, I don't, Swiss are probably not going to be allowed to go to America for quite a while because of what prompt What prompted the move from Peoria to Alabama? Well, for the she went with her husband different places and we oh, actually okay. i was born in peoria but i never lived in peoria although i had a show there a couple years ago at the contemporary sure. thing there um which was a lot of fun um she was in pekin and they went to alabama no to indiana and different places and her husband is a southerner from kentucky and he got transferred but then they ended up you know, the sort of snowbird thing, they went down to, she lives in a really nice part of Alabama. I was always like, I don't, sorry, I don't go south of the Mason-Dixon line. <laughs> but uh, she's like, come, come. And I went there, they live in this Gulf Shores, which is a little she-she. It's really sweet and nice sure. place. But it really is difficult for me and for her right now too, because the people think the COVID is a conspiracy and uh, you know it's just politically it's not the place for me you know yeah. i live in my little social democratic world here so. The, so, the, the chicago question is what neighborhoods did you live in when you oh were uh, mostly in the near north side germantown actually which okay. are, you know parts of uh um Where? lincoln Where? park and just north um i lived okay. on cornelia street which is funny because my wife's name is cornelia right by the 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 Schwabischube and uh, uh, so on, so, um, old German areas, uh, which were mostly the Mexicans and, and so on. Um, Ashley, um, they've all changed now. They changed names and everything. You know, they, 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 I should have bought the house, man. I probably could have made some money. Um, 
it was when it was, you know, I lived there when they were artist neighborhoods and stuff too. And uh, they're not at all anymore. And I was showing mostly when that was when all the galleries were in those built, that couple of buildings. That's right. why I know Paul Klein and stuff, did all stuff with Paul. He's unfortunately dying of cancer right as we speak, but he's a great guy and he did wonderful things. Um, yeah, so it was that that sort of association there with the West Side, and um, I was in the near North. My college roommate, ba, ba, uh, Roberto Carrillo and Marcos Rivera, were both from the South Side, the mm. Bush, and so so I had mixed places and so on. Just kept moving around wherever I could afford. Typical artist. Yeah, and that, and that's 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 Chicago. That's that's been the story of all of this. If someone could sink in, they'd sink in and get a building. Yeah. If other you 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 root you you root yourself out and you move to an area where you feel and and uh, and and that's that's the organic flow of of this amazing city and this amazing metropolitan area. Because my, my wife loved it even more than me, and I loved it. Uh, she just loved all the because she didn't give a shit about the art world. She liked you know the museum. I worked in the field museum and sometimes in the MCA to help them when they had, you know, so I, in, in the, by the way, in the field museum, if you want to see something I did, I did with Raul. And so we built the um, Eskimo house and most of the Egyptian exhibition, including the Mastaba that has to do with me. And so yeah. so I, I had a nice thing going there and so on. And uh, she loved that stuff. And she loved all those little ethnic neighborhoods with the cool food and the music and stuff. And, and because of my friendship with Raul and, and Bob and uh, Marcos and so is a lot of uh, Latino culture, which she liked. And so, so yeah, she, she was really in love with it. You know, I was like, I was teasing her. It's like, uh, you know, I think you're doing it. You're even more Chicago, although she still has this sex in, so she never picked yeah. up Chicago. Yeah. But, People are worried about the gentrification, but I, I I find that that these enclaves will always continue to survive. Our diversity will always continue. Oh, well, some places are bad. New York has very big problems. Uh, they pretty well used them up. Well, they've had to, they've had to uh, sink yeah. areas. Yeah, where, but... and it's and, and London. I mean, when I was buying the house in Switzerland, I was well, buying. We're getting in debt to the bank, right? So we're looking at the areas that I own out. Who should just give you a house? We'll yeah, you know, really, here you don't really. Plus, so I was flipping out because it's like twice the cost of a house in Chicago. Yeah, and that's a big problem in Switzerland because it's small and we have green laws. So there's where there's a house. Yeah. But I went to London. I live usually with Mark Francis, one of the YBAs, and his wife Nikki Hurston. They're sure. buddies with uh, her, uh, Damien and so on. You know, so I'm connected to those guys. And there was him. He was like, "Come see this," you know. And he showed me the houses that they were double Switzerland, so like four times the cost. Of, of a decent place in Chicago. And so I was like, holy shit. He goes, yeah, well, you, well thank God for the YBA thing. He, uh, um, uh, Have you seen you the know, film of when they were when when they were trying to formaldehyde that shark the first time? Uh, well, he didn't help with that, but he was in the show. I mean, Damien came to him and put him in the show and, and so on. Mm -hmm. He's a painter. No, but it's a, there's footage of, of, of them, of Damien trying to get that formaldehyde. Yeah shark tank and it's a big it's a huge mess he's, a, he's it's, an interesting character actually i even prefer him to jeff but uh, but um, anyway so but he was showing and so th there i said to mark is like well what are artists going to do this i have no idea we're not going to have an art scene it's it's right. not going to be in london um so that's one reason berlin could make it because berlin is surrounded by brandenburg has all these empty spots and they are aching to take over. They are sure they're going to take over from the United States, by the way. Just so you know, you've got a hostile enemy there who's calculating. And they think they're going to do it with the art schools and the uh, and, and so on. And they, and they get a lot of money pumped into them from the government, which the Swiss don't. So, uh, yeah, yeah. So, but I just heard from a good friend of mine who's a German. He said that now the costs are so high in Berlin that they're having trouble. Here, here's, here's my <laughs> Here's my favorite uh, contemporary German painter. Ah, cool. You know Heisig? Do you know Heisig's nope. work? No. Bernard Heisig. Uh, he 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 um he's a nice mesh of 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 figurative object ground into abstraction. Ah. Bernard Bernard yeah. Heisig. So, but but uh, that, that I'm not that uh, fan of gentrification. But uh, what else are you going to do? I mean, right. You know, it's like 
It has to. The only thing is that it was not nice as it pushes out the people like when I lived there, uh, right around the, the corner from Max Tavern and so on there, then the, it was Mexican families and Filipinos and so, and they're all gone. You know, so they all got pushed out, which upsets but, me more than more. As it, as it, when you were, when you were at Illinois State, uh, so you weren't, uh, you weren't aware of like well, it's the monster roster, or I mean, you weren't but, uh, aware. Before, of but they were before me, of right, course. Right. Um, I mean, the, uh, even Jim Nutt, and so it was a little older yeah. than me. Um, so I'm after them. But yeah, we were aware they were the dominant Chicago idea. Uh -huh. um, I really liked uh, Kosoff, um, sure. um, Madame Luton, you know, because of the political aspects too, and his wife, um, um, Nancy Spiro. A uh, book about her is the first thing, first thing I bought for my. Nancy. Um, yeah, so I forgot about Nancy. She did some really great, like almost sequential freeze things. Wow. I wonder if I stole that. She has Amazing. a whole long. Oh, well. <laughs> All right, Kayla. <laughs> you get to wrap Sorry. this up. No, 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 no. Oh, my goodness. No. Um, okay. Uh, plug us uh, where people can find oh, yeah, the, where, where you can find me. Yes. Everywhere. I am both myself with my crazy three names, Mark Staff Brandl, of Deutsch, this is Mark Staff Brandl. Then, and that is, uh, so I'm in Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter. Uh, Look at that. He's been censored again. He's been censored again the minute he gets personal. And the, <laughs> yeah, and the Dr. Great Art as well. So the two and the Dr. Great Art stuff is generally only art for the people who are maybe upset by my nonstop ranting and raving or pontificating, as you said, <coughs> about politics. Um, no, no. Then you can go to Dr. Great Art and that will be 90% art. Um, so you can find me in all those. Facebook the most because you can say the most and you can argue. Um, Instagram, though, mostly my younger students or so ex-students are there and so on. Uh, and then I have two websites. MarkStaffBrandle.com, which is sort of a history of the whole thing. And then the newest thing, just for the newest project, DrGreatArt.com. And that's Dr., the short Dr., D-R-G-R-E-A-T-A-R-T.com. I do a podcast by that name, which you can get everywhere. It's from Libsyn. So it's um, um, it's in Stitcher and Apple and, you know, everywhere. You just put in Dr. Great Art. And come. That actually put up a couple times as one of, like, the top ten Art history podcast, which I was kind of surprised because it's kind of quirky and so on. Like maybe there's just not that many art history. But <laughs> I mostly listen to a podcast myself about science, so I know so much about well, art. You know, I think you know Robert Hughes. You got you're competing with Robert Hughes and Sister Wendy, right? Yeah, uh, Robert Hughes, I love yeah, and and Matthew Collins and so on and so of, of course. Of course. Um, yeah, it, it, that so you can get the podcast, which used to be every two weeks got kind of messed up because of corona and everything so that depends uh i have two two youtube channels but they haven't been keeping up uh we'll be able to have this you you're gonna have this recorded somewhere right kayla you said i can um download this after the fact and then yep. uh you should be able to post it up I'll, if you uh, can give it to me somehow then i'll put it on my youtube and i'll refer to right. it in the podcast and so on um, yeah, so actually, because my name is so weird, and then with this Dr. Great Art thing, if you type either of those in, I should pop up, you know, it's, uh, if you put just Brandel, it's not so good, because there's, uh, like, uh, you know, all these Bavarian beer makers and crazy stuff, because it's a typical German name, um, although there is a really cool, when I was in Prague, recently got invited, that was really nice, they have a, in the Czech Republic, they have a late Baroque painter who was their superstar, named uh, Peter Jan Brandl, and he is my great, 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 great uncle. Very and so, uh, because we're Bohemian, so Germans from the Czech Republic, and he was, they were so mixed. And uh, that was really nice, man, they were really nice people, and I can So, uh, so his, sometimes he comes, I'm trying to attract more attention to him, so now more and more he shows up. He, he was really famous, got a bit forgotten. So now I keep pumping him out and other people. And so his name is rising too. So I'm competing with myself when I get my uncle. You know, no. it's, it's, I'm going to ask you one more question. How would the, how would the philosopher Mark Staff Brandel uh, com 
uh, what would he say about Dr. Great Art? Well, I had to do that. I had to apply my metaform theory to myself. My my doctor father, so the, your, your professor advisor, is right. Philip Ursprung. And he's the, about the most important art historian in, in Europe. And he demanded that I do that because he said, you got to do it. Even Freud tried to psychoanalyze himself and failed. He goes, you do one chapter and fail. You try to do your best because I didn't really want to write about myself. You know how it is. It's like you write about others. Blah, 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 blah. Then you write about yourself. And it's like, oh, God, because it's like. You, so you needed this third. You needed this third person. You needed. Yeah. This. Yeah. So I usually get other people. Usually Donny Amon writes it for me. And he's an author. So he writes 100 times better than me in both German and English. So he usually does it. Or my friend Tom Z. Mahoney. But I did it. Yeah, I analyzed it. Um, yeah, I think it's probably the application of my mongrel thing to presence. I did it on purpose for that, partially. I saw a wonderful TED talk by a woman who is a musician and mixes some weird stuff, Celtic and science fiction, or got, got vice versa. But she had this wonderful thing. She said they realized that they were like really popular, but they had no place to go. There was no radio stations, there was no festivals, or whatever. So she decided to find your tribe and go to them. And I've been looking for a long time for what happens post gallery. I have galleries, but I've not been, I think it's over with. I don't have galleries. They have me, you know, how that works. But anyway, I think it's over with, unless you have a superstar like Hauser and Vyot or, or Gangozi and Gogo or something, you know, or, or David Swerna or something, because then they pump millions into you. But even then, it's actually philosophically over with. And we don't know what's up next. So I've been looking for other, instead of looking at it negatively, I was looking more positive. What else could it? And I started looking for ideas. And one of them was this. I noticed that when I have uh, openings, which we call in Europe, vernissage, so opening parties, whatever, mm -hmm. um, I have tons and tons of people. And, uh, you know, usually here, so like a, a small museum or so, we'll have something like 50 to 100 people at most, maybe 50, 20 people at an opening or something. You know, there's, there's a lot of museums and stuff. And I have like 300. But, of course, I don't get paid for it. And most of them are artists and young people and ex-students and so on. That's why, because I know so many. And they can't afford to buy anything because I can't afford to buy anything. But you know how that is with artists. You can't afford to buy your own damn art. So um, I was like, well, what can I do to get sort of to them? So I decided to um, essentially do the vernissages as, as art. And so that's when I would give my speech or whatever and stuff. And so so uh, that so yeah, it's, a, it's another mongrelization. And I usually make... I, I paint the screen as a painting, big thing with like an empty spot in it so I can project on it, but it's actually a painting. I hang other paintings around it, like the one I did about artists uh, from actors, often in an installation if they'll let me. I go as far as they let me, you know, I'm always like, let me paint on the wall, you know. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a mother mongrel thing. And, and that is my metaphor, I think, is that I believe this mongrelization is the and is the way forward is the, you know, the, the uh, Well, we need this. We, we need, we need to go to a civics in a civic situation or a faith community. We need to be part of a group, a dynamic to experience ideas and art is the clearest, most direct way to that. And um, I think these screens are, are, there's a threshold on that. So, um, we're gonna be out. And we're gonna be out again soon. We're gonna we're gonna conquer this, and um, I uh, hope. I, I I I honestly thought you'd have a little more wisdom for me. <laughs> like what? What are you looking for? They're not mucking. I was on. open. For, I was open for some optimism uh, from your from your wisdom and experience. Yeah. After, about after what? I got lots of experience. I don't know about wisdom. After, after overcoming all of the. All of societal's ills in your in your life. Well, uh, that, that's the thing is, I think the the mongrelization. That's uh, I think that is really important when you cross barriers. I think I said something about that. Um, I think that's the way to go. Syncretism. We have to kill purism, which I think is a trope of fascism. So I think minimalism sort of is the death of art, actually. Uh, they made great stuff, but I think that's it. Um, that would be my thing that I learned about life is that it's this syncretism that counts. My favorite holiday is Easter. Everybody says, yeah, but that was originally pagan. Yeah, that's what makes it even cooler. 
you know it's everything yeah the plants come back rabbits have eggs or some damn thing there's chocolate and jesus you know it's like yeah yeah great and they're like well that doesn't mix yes it does and it mixes really well let me see i have a i did something about mongrelization once in one of a but uh, I think that'd be the only, I don't have huge wisdom beyond that, but is that, um, yeah, it's a, this mongrelization, which comics have, because you read pictures and you, you know, and then you look at words and so on. Uh, David Carey, the philosopher said that it's an inherently impure entity. That's what I'm looking for in art. But if you amplify this, uh, it can be anti purist It's emancipation from our thing. So, to me mix everything uh, and every time you cross a barrier it's an important political thing i mean just look how people get so uptight when somebody's not sure if they're more male or female or something like it's any of your damn business you know so like who cares but it's interesting that it crosses and so when you when you do these mixed things i think well, that will pick up the best of postmodernism and get us out of postmodernism at the same time and i think that's important for society I think it's going to be a difficult birth, though, because people are very, like categories. It keeps them calm. They like to stuff you in categories. You already said that. You know, they pigeonhole you. Um, keeps them certain that the world makes sense, because of course the biggest fear most of us have, probably my biggest fear, is that there is no meaning to all this, and there may be no God, and we're all alone, and then we die. Okay, so you got to sort of get over that. But <laughs> oh, I have to do this before we get so it's in the video. That's my story that I always use. That I always use the point when I want to make a point, <laughs> a philosophical point, a Zorro sort. Um, that would be about the only thing I have. This is this mongrelization, which another friend of mine who is an artist, Alex Mesmer, and his husband uh, Rachel Mueller, they do a sort of mongrelization that's more conceptually based, and they call it democratic art. And so I think yes, it's a more it's a difficult thing. Democracy is difficult, and it goes mongrel. But it's um, it's the way to go. So that isn't a whole hell of a lot, but it's about the best I got for wisdom. It's messy, but you know it's 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 uh, it's the best operating system that I've seen so far. And, and highly American, actually. Even though Americans have been resisting it, you know they'll be like shouting about "Don't play foreign music." I mean, come on, Jesus! Everything of any importance in America is half African, a third Jew, and it's like come on you know it's like this is what makes us and what makes it so much more exciting than Wagner or some damn thing you know it's like which is high quality but i don't give a damn i want every, James every, time, you make, every time you make a point mark you get muted out i don't know why i think it is. <laughs> every time you make a, every time you are you're you're stating an axiom from your point of view it drops and I don't know what that is. So we'll I think that's uh, uh, Murdoch and um, and right. um, Gates and uh, Elvis. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Kayla. Hey, so I'm gonna I'm gonna, I'm gonna I just I, I cannot thank you enough. I cannot thank you enough. So if, if uh, people here in the Midwest in Chicago hasn't haven't seen Mark in a while, I hope this has been a treat. Um, I'm this is humbling for me. It's a pleasure. Thanks, I, I know I know we will get some time. Uh, I am an optimist, and I will see you on this side of the pond for that. <laughs> yeah, and come and visit me, too, and people listening, too. I would love that. I'd love to have visitors and so on, too, you know? Then I'll take you to Italy. As well, after everybody's not dying. But. Kayla, give us a, give us a good wrap-up. No, yeah. no, this was wonderful. I am completely honored to have had this, this time with you. And... Um, yeah, I learned so much, Doctor Gradar, and I'm I'm, just, I'm gonna finish and keep up listening to the podcast because I really I really enjoy it. Thank you, and and then send me ideas too. I appreciate those people will write to me and, and ask me things like this uh, napkin. Uh, I like that. I like that. I, maybe I'm kind of a Renaissance artist at heart, but even in the Doctor Gradar, I like to like. Well, what do you, what would you say about this, or what would you paint about that? Oh, that's cool. You know instead of going more of just myself one wrote to me and say what would you say about genius oh jesus i never thought about it and that's what's really nice so please do and then write to me and say say something about this and then i have to like go learn about it and you know, i like think the, this, I go the delivery it. system i think i think the delivery system on any idea in a tangible form 
is um, is the way to go. As, as and I'm speaking in my role now as a as a guy who's an advocate for museums and repositories. And so, because uh, um, um, we wrestle with technology all the time and updating technology, and you know, I, I go, I, I pull a drawer open, and we still have these old uh, data data disks or whatever the hell those. Things are. <laughs> And good luck translating that information. And, uh, <laughs> Floppies. Uh, yeah, yeah. But um, I, I cannot thank you enough. This has been a total joy for me. Thank and, you too. And Kayla, Kayla is our, our is our resident uh, uh, um, conduit to the audience, and so I, I, I hope I hope it it passed through well here. So. But yeah, then I will put it up and so. And I, I want to talk to you about a couple other things too. I'll get back to you about this. I have um, another se sort of sequential paper thing. But I'll talk to you all about that later. That I could I'd very love, easily love, send to possibly show for something. It's just you know. Oh, I'd love fun. to. I'd love to. I that that to me again. Comics saved my life. I I, I talk about that all the time. They they really. Yeah. They really Which did. ones? I'm oh, sorry. We got to end. But so, Comic, we'll yeah. talk about another one. What a pleasure. Go Thank ahead, wrap it up. Comments. God bless you, Mark. Thank you. You too, guys, and stay healthy. Nice to virtually. I will, post your, uh, I will post your links on the video on Facebook, and then I will get to so we can post it elsewhere. Thank you. Thank Very you. Much. Be well. And bye to all listeners. We didn't answer anything. I'll write to you all later. I think I can read the comments. So. Yes. <laughs> Thank you bye. so much, everyone who's tuned in. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Oh, wait, wait. And then I'll uh, show one more thing, my chair. Oh, that's perfect. <laughs> that's perfect way to end. <laughs> An Illinois thing. Okay. That's no, that's a north that's a north side thing, Mark. That's a yeah. perfect. Uh, perfect. I love it. I love it. <laughs> it's the cut. Take care, buddy. I know. So, <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. I don't get out of here. I don't know how.